Hi. So hello. Can can you hear me? Very well. Okay, excellent. Right, let's get started. Um, a very warm hello to you all, wherever you are, um, and a very special thanks to the to the moderators. Uh, special thanks to the to the moderators, uh, Letitia and Daniela, of this uh, Tessel Evo event. It's the first time I've done anything like this, so forgive me for uh, any blunders that may uh, come about during the next uh, hour. And uh, a special thanks to Sandeep and Kapil, who have patiently tried to teach me how to, to, to use this uh, system. And uh, a special thanks to you for, for being here today for this session, which is called uh, Why Clear Now. And uh, just to get started, I need to just check one thing here. Excellent. I've been in languages education for about 30 years and um, and I can see from the responses here that many of you are also uh, language teachers. I'd like to ask you a question which is how many of you are language teachers primarily of English? If you can just write yes or, or no, how many of you are primarily language teachers of, of English language? And what we can see here is quite many, quite many, okay. The role of languages in education has never been as important as it is now, it's quite clear. And there are reasons for that which we'll explore during the course of this session here. Um, but it is quite clear that languages education has become extremely important and it's become important, just let me get rid of this. My screen has frozen. Okay, I'll answer the call. Just a minute. And this has come up at the same time. As a need to really and this has come up at the same time as a need to really rethink education in general. So what's been happening in the last 20 years in various countries is that people have been looking at educational performance and in that they've been looking at uh, language education performance and there have been two things happening. One has been like top down <clears throat> where various ideas have been coming into education and changes have been made, often quite small changes and often quite unsuccessful and then there have been bottom-up uh, initiatives which have come primarily from teachers and sometimes have been started without any real scientific knowledge of whether they work or not. And one of these is what we call content and language integrated learning. And I would like to thank uh, the last speaker, Gisela Langer, who some of you <clears throat> would have been uh, participating in her presentation for that excellent sort of introduction to, to, this, uh, to this area of CLIL. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about why, why CLIL and why CLIL now. And if you have specific questions, put them in the chat and I'll see if I can multitask and handle those questions uh, as we go through. So going back in time, People in languages education said something needs to change. We're not getting the results that we should be getting considering how many hours we are devoting to language teaching. We're having problems sometimes with the, with the students, with the children and the young people who are not really very excited about learning languages no matter how good we are as teachers. And something needs to change. And so a group of people looked at a whole load of different um, types of uh, language teaching operation that were going on around the world. Uh, going on from Canada to the United States, through to <clears throat> through Africa, through into to Australasia. And we looked at various of these and we said, what is it that could actually work in mainstream education with normal students, yeah, normal people, the Millie Molly Mandis of the world. And when looking at these, these techniques, these techniques like immersion, like content-based language teaching, 
English for specific purposes and so on, we realize that actually, good as these are, they are not necessarily quite the same approach that we could use by radically rethinking uh, how we put language teaching into the curriculum. And so content of language integrated learning, CLIL, was actually born as a result of looking at excellent practice, often in very special environments, often in, in elite types of privileged environments, and looking at how could we bring the real success factors of these into, into mainstream education. And that's how CLIL evolved back in the 1990s. And I noticed that Gisela gave you three definitions of CLIL. Uh, thank you to those who voted, but the one with my name was, was uh, perhaps the one which you preferred. I want to just say something about the definition, because this definition of CLIL is an approach which is for the teaching of both content and language, was deliberately open and deliberately wide. And it was like an umbrella term under which the techniques that were so excellent in content-based instruction, communicative language teaching, immersion, could actually be drawn together in, in a different way. It's a little bit like Cirque du Soleil. I don't know whether, how many of you are familiar with that, but I guess most of us, which is that it wasn't so much inventing a new form of entertainment. It was a matter of taking excellence in drama, excellence in gymnastics, excellence in a whole lot of other existing different areas and repackaging them in a different way. So CLIL was uh, deliberately an umbrella term by which the teaching of both content and language would be brought together. And it is subtly different to types of immersion and content-based instruction which have been so well developed in certain parts of the world for different reasons. When we look at what the essence of CLIL is as a teacher, uh, doing uh, classes using this technique or as a student actually uh, learning through the technique, <laughs> we can see that there are like five, what they call the five C's um, alive in each lesson. This means that the teacher, <coughs> excuse me, the teacher needs to understand the cognitive demands of learning this specific topic or this specific area. The content needs to be clearly defined there, as does the language. So the content demands, the language demands need to be very clearly there. It needs to be linked into the community where the students are, into their lives, and it needs to be focused on competence building and developing competences at the same time as, as, as learning the, uh, the content or the language. And these techniques, these techniques are used by both language teachers and teachers of other subjects. And one of the radical <coughs> uh, results of CLIL has been in rethinking the types of working life practice of teachers in the curriculum and also rethinking the curriculum. If you look at modern curriculum, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, you'll see that there's been quite a big process of, of integration of integrating more mathematics, more physics into health sciences, of, of, of integrating biology and, 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 and geography into environmental studies, and the same thing has been happening with language. So CLIL is actually very much um, a technique which is being mirrored in uh, other parts of the educational curriculum. It is part of a trend. The actual basis of good CLIL is a little bit like the basis of excellent primary school teaching. It involves language supportive methods and activities. It involves enriching the environment as, a, as an enriched language environment. And it involves various forms of what we call scaffolding. And this uh, approach, the methods that are used, are very much a strong reflection of Piaget, of Vygotsky, and of other very prominent 
uh, visionaries uh, over the years in, in the world of language. So if we think about a clear lesson, and I'm not actually doing one at the moment, which perhaps I should, you'll see that there is support at the word level, there's support at the phrase level, and there is support at the image level when the students are actually studying content through, through the language. <clears throat> now, I said earlier that this started really as a grassroots uh, operation. Um, parents, families in certain parts of Europe, especially, which is where I have been working, wanted better English language results uh, for, in terms of their children. But in, and over the time, they've also wanted better language learning results with their children. And what we've seen with CLIL is that it is not uh, a technique which is specifically about teaching or learning English, but it has become a technique for actually teaching and learning different languages, including, <clears throat> including, uh, including in some ways re re national, regional, and, and minority languages. So it's become developed as a very profoundly interesting and, dare I say, powerful uh, technique. And it started before teacher development in the area started. And now when we look at what the skills and competencies are for a teacher who's engaged in CLIL, we'll see that actually they are holistic in a way. They are bringing, like Secteur Soleil, they're bringing the very best understanding of excellence in methodologies, and they're combining uh, content and language in which to to make those uh, to, to bring out the best in terms of the learners. And one very interesting aspect of teachers who develop themselves in CLIL and are trained in CLIL is that they actually improve their overall skills in actually leading classes and managing uh, teaching in general. In other words, it's not just a matter of tomorrow I'm going to do CLIL and I'm going to start teaching in English, but it has become very much a matter of I want to explore the very best in me uh, in order to make me the best possible teacher in order to serve the students in the best possible way that I can. And that's probably one re reason why the uh, results have been so good in a very, very short period of time, because the types of teacher who get involved with this kind of way of working appear to become very much better overall, probably because they become happier teachers, but probably they become revitalized because they feel they're in even greater control of bringing out the best in their students. And that gives a very strong, enriched kind of uh, kind of uh, professional feedback for them. Now, this teaching in English, and I'll talk about that now because I see many of you are actually English teachers. The teaching in English is spreading like, like wildfire right across the world. And the reasons for this is very often to do with certain areas of the world having uh, more income and families in those areas wanting their children to have an international access uh, to, to the global phenomena that we live in. And if we look at some countries, we'll see that the introduction of teaching in English, which is very common, has not always been successful. And what I want to explain here is that teaching in English is different to teaching through English, right? Because teaching in English means I just change the language and I start speaking English, like uh, teachers in international schools often uh, are requ required to do. But teaching through English requires really thinking back, okay, what are these methodologies and what are these activities that need to be created in order to make the curriculum as successful as possible in terms of both teaching the subject and also teaching the, teaching the language. And CLIL is very much about teaching through English. If we look at Europe, we can see that this has uh, expanded uh, exponentially in some countries. Uh, Austria, Finland, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Spain, there's a considerable expansion of interest 
in teaching through English. If we take the case of Malaysia, which in 2003 started a major effort to have science and maths taught through English, I think on, in fairness it was probably more teaching in English because the teachers were not given those techniques, those methodologies in order to make this uh, experiment as successful as possible. If we take the Middle East, we see a big push towards using CLIL type techniques as we can also see in China. South America, Latin America, Colombia, um, other countries are looking at how are we going to improve performance, especially in terms of language teaching, and they are slowly moving towards the, the techniques of CLIL. But what we can see throughout the world is a combination of teaching in English, which, yeah, it works very well with clever, clever young people, sure. But it doesn't work so well with um, your average, your average students, right? And we can see teaching through English, which is working very well with children of mixed abilities. And I think that is a sign that as a, as a technique, it, has a, it, it is holistically good and sound in relation to bringing out the best of a broad range of, of young people. So the results of CLIL in action have been very good, but the results of teaching in English have not been so good. So to come to the, the, the end of this first part of this presentation, and I, I'm following the chat, <laughs> And um, I'm sort of I'm trying to uh, bring in your ideas, so keep them coming, okay? So that this is not a, a one-hour CLIL monologue. We can see that CLIL is transformative. Now, there are some three drivers which are very powerful at the moment. As Gisela Lange said, and I, I, I repeat this, uh, we can see CLIL techniques being used to revitalize minority languages, to support heritage languages, and to accelerate the language learning of immigrants into countries. So it is no longer a foreign language kind of activity. It has become an educational activity with a major focus on languages. But English language, for sure, has been a major, a major driver. But another major driver is this search for quality education. In fact, it's an urgent search because the societies have realized that as, as the globalization processes have continued, the, the economic pressure to have more workers who are rapidly skilled in order to support the, the various societies has become acute. And education for too long has been the poor cousin uh, of, of, for example, ministries in many countries. People always talk about how important education is, but in many countries, teachers are still badly paid, schools are under-resourced, and when cuts come, they often hit education before anything else. Or when politicians want to um, try to build their, their, their status, uh, one of the first areas they may criticize can be teachers and education. And that is so damaging and has been so damaging that I think part of the reason for the development of CLIL at the grassroots has been teachers taking control of what they know they can do and, and slowly making it happen. And where it's been really successful is when the ministries and the administrators then realize that the outcomes of this kind of integrated approach to language is, uh, is even better. Very often in the curriculum, there isn't enough time to develop language, English language, for example, sufficiently. The teacher may be absolutely excellent, but there isn't enough time. And when you look at CLIL as an aspect of quality education, it's also because it's an aspect of quality performance, because the English language teacher is actually getting support from different uh, aspects of how the curriculum is taught. So it, the second driver is very much about this demand for competence-based education, for learning to do as you learn, and also for um, actually making a change happen throughout the whole, the whole curriculum involving all subjects. And the national performance, if you look at the figures on how certain countries have performed is quite quite staggering in terms of 
those countries which are introducing uh, an integrated approach to education and those that, that are not. And if we look at this figure, I don't know how clearly this, uh, you can see these figures here, but you can see quite clearly countries like Australia, Finland, Canada, Netherlands, the New Zealand, these countries are steadily, steadily growing. And then you can see countries in decline. I'm sorry, but Italy is one of those for my moderators. Norway, France, Sweden, Japan, countries that have remained in a way more traditional in how they're actually teaching different subjects. So something's happening out there now, and it is happening with the language teaching community, and it is happening because of this, primarily. It's a matter of not having students learning now to use later but having students learning now to use now. And that is one of the, possibly one of the reasons why young people, especially adolescents, respond so well to this kind of activity in the language classroom and outside the, the language classroom as well, because it is very much a competence-based approach of getting the knowledge of, of understanding how to act with the knowledge as soon as you get the knowledge and also understanding the deeper values of, of what I'm learning and why I'm learning. So it's very much reflective of the types of curriculum which are being found and designed for subjects other than, than languages. And when you look at the high performing countries, those countries which have really turned their educational system around very quickly. And if you think of 30 years, it's quite normal to turn an education system around. Some of these have done it in more like 15. Then you'll see that there are certain things in common happening in those countries. And these are very close to CLIL. One is recognizing that something needs to change. But recognizing that it needs to change in terms of the real resources we have and the real mindsets that we have and the real time available that we have. A second one is emphasizing equity, equality of access. In the old days, English language used to be, you know, for the bright kids or the privileged kids and the kids who are going to be whatever. But when you look at what can be achieved by opening the doors on quality language learning, in an equitable way, it is absolutely astonishing the results that can be obtained. And a third one is viewing education in a holistic way, which all of us as, as good teachers want to do all the time, but find ourselves working in educational systems or in schools or with curricula, which actually doesn't really in, encourage a, a holistic approach to education. Then another three is a focus on creativity, which means that the teacher doesn't do what I'm doing now, which is talking too much, but actually is becomes the, 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 the conductor of the orchestra and gives the time and the structured uh, facilities and the language support for the kids to actually learn as effectively as they can in being creative. And another one is learning how to learn and then recognizing the newly emerged curriculum, uh, the importance of literacy uh, within the curriculum. So what we see, and what we've seen over the last 25 years, is when, when language teachers get involved with integrating this subject more deeply into the school, even on quite a small level, the results are very, very good and have been seen to be, in some cases, quite profound. And I emphasize again, uh, they have been particularly good with children of diverse abilities, which is very, very interesting and also very encouraging for all of us there. The third driver, and this is the final driver I want to talk about, and this will take a little bit longer than the other ones, is the issue of relevance, that this has emerged as particularly relevant to the needs of modern young people and modern society. And let's turn to the young people to begin with. I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Um, how many hours a week does an average 15-year-old in your country, in a city in your country, spend using the internet? I repeat the question. Okay. How many hours a week does an average 15-year-old 
living in a city in your country spend on the internet? And I have here 30. Severia 15. Benjamin, too many. No, a nice one. Benjamin's probably a parent. Piero, Caroline, oh gosh, 50, and so forth. Right. It's a lot. Yeah, I'm going to show you some new news. It's a lot. Yeah, I'm going to show you some new new statistics on this in a moment. But what is absolutely fascinating about the young people in our schools now is that the exposure to the new technologies appears to be having a profound impact on their preferred learning styles. Okay? Now, I know all the generations are different. Just as we were different to our parents and our parents were different to their parents. But we're talking here about a very interesting cognitive shift. And, well, for many years, people have been worried about it. Parents, teachers, scientists, they've been thinking, oh, looking at all the negative consequences of this high exposure to, to media devices. And I share that. But the fact is that these young people are profoundly different to those that went before. In the United States, we have, we have a lot of evidence coming out about having higher levels of attention deficit disorder amongst adolescents right across the states you know um, and you look at those you look at those figures and you think okay it's very good for the companies that produce medication like ritalin but is it partly okay maybe it's to do with lifestyle da 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 or is it partly an overdiagnosis related to the fact that education has become out of tune with this digital generation who actually do more than us or certainly more than myself need to use as they learn and learn as they use and when you go into a clear classroom what you'll see is that because the major focus of attention is not on you are here to learn language or you are here to learn geography but it's more on we're going to combine these two, which kind of confuses the attitude of the student who thinks, oh, I'm doing English again, or oh, I'm doing geography again. And it, it hides that, and it opens up the major focus on doing the doing, as opposed to having attitudes about doing the doing. And I think this generation is absolutely fascinating. And when you look at integrated education, and you look at the demands of the internet generation, you can see a real link. So those pioneers of, of CLIL, those teachers across different countries who've been exploring how to make the curriculum work in a way that they can integrate the language more deeply, uh, are in a way forerunners. They, could, they had that vision of, of what was coming. And we have also now the emergence of something which I find very interesting, called DSL or DFL, which is digital as a second language. In other words, we have a big shift happening amongst native speakers of English who use English in languages and particularly amongst young people. And these shifts are directly linked to the use of mobile devices. And if you look at these figures here, these figures are from 2011 and 2013, and you'll see a very big jump in the availability of tablet devices at home amongst newborns up to the uh, age of eight, and a very big increase in the use of these devices from 2011, 36%, to 2013, 72%. When you look at a child using a tablet device, especially when you take an adult of my age and you take an eight-year-old and you see how fast each of them can actually understand how to use something, which is why I'm so grateful to the technicians who helped me understand how to use this today. Um, you'll see that the whole navigation attitude to learning, how I'm learning what I'm doing and where I'm going, and the importance of a high degree of autonomy are key characteristics of what they're doing. Personally, I don't think we should be using tablet devices in the classrooms because I think the amount of time we have in class is so limited that uh, we've got better things to do in terms of the face-to-face -face communication. But the reality is that these young people are using these devices more hours a week 
than they're actually spending in school. So we needed to look at how to actually adapt our teaching approaches in order to um, complement their, their real lives, okay, and complement the preferred learning experiences that they're having. Parents throughout the world, researchers emphasize the need to stimulate and develop creativity and thinking skills. And yet we are still right across the world, of course there are many exceptions, but right across the world we still have the students go into the class, the door closes, the teacher stands up and talks. And that's it. And the students listen and they are supposed to learn. Whereas when you look at CLIL, you'll find that the amount of teacher talking time is reduced heavily, but the amount of linguistic and conceptual scaffolding is, is enhanced, which is why the materials and the activities need to be very carefully thought out before the teachers go into that classroom and before the, uh, <clears throat> the students start to learn. So what we're seeing here is very much uh, an approach which appears to be complementary for this internet generation. But there's something else which is very important which I'd like to focus on towards the end here before I come back to the, to the chat box. Um, um, right, how do I put this? In the last 10 years in, in, in particular, the equipment used for looking inside the brain has become cheaper and more commonly available uh, in, in, in uh, research institutes, etc. 10, 15 years ago, very expensive and mostly used in the pharmaceutical industry now increasingly used for analyzing and researching and examining the impact of, of uh, various stimulation on the, on the brain, including education. And some of this work has been done on language learning, and it's been done on what the difference between learning language in a so-called uh, traditional way, learning it in a communicative way, and learning it in a, a, in a clear way. And the results are very, very exciting. And the results are particularly exciting because they're positive. I mean, they don't analyze whether those students become happier or, or, or richer or whatever, but they do look at the learning capabilities. And they're very, very positive because it seems that if you have a school <clears throat> where more than one language is active in the school environment, in other words, if you're in uh, Argentina, you have 80% of the teaching in, in Spanish, 20% in English. If you're in Italy, you may have 5% in English, 95% in Spanish at secondary level. The, pos the impact of that is very, very positive on the mind and brain of these young people. And in the early days of looking at the clear results and how they seem to accelerate uh, language learning so well, one of the reasons was, and we thought this was like a honeymoon, we couldn't quite understand it, but one of the reasons was probably that the students were really enjoying what they were doing. But another one was that they probably found it stimulating to have something so different uh, during the course of their, of their school week. And there's an added value which is appearing from this, what they would call bilingual approach to, to learning, where there is more English in the curriculum, for example, than only in the English lesson, right? Which uh, seems to be a very interesting and positive uh, stimulant on the brain. And the key word here is, the, is, is neuroplasticity and the impact of thinking in English for an Italian student or a Spanish student or a, a student in Uruguay and actually thinking about English. And the thinking through English is very exciting in terms of how it engages the student and the mind and the brain of the student. And this research you can find, you can see details of this research by googling uh, every week, there's, there are new reports coming out on, on the impact of education on neuroplasticity, and quite a lot of that relates to putting students into environments where they feel relaxed and free to use the language that they have, no matter how limited 
their uh, vocabulary or their understanding of, of grammar is. But they're actually, by, by using the language resources that they have in order to learn something, right? And those, those results are very, very interesting indeed. And I think this is becoming, this research from the educational neurosciences is becoming a major reason why um, the interest in CLIL is actually, is actually accelerating now. <clears throat> the impact of having the ability to both think to both think and do in a second language within the curriculum is uh, interesting in terms of certain uh, identifiable outcomes. So one of those is the, the the flexibility of the mind. It's almost like it's a form of exercise which stretches the mind and which enables these young people to begin to think in different languages, a different way, sorry. Another one is their capacity for problem solving. And that is that if they are in a situation where they can actually draw on more than one language to do a problem, and I'm talking here about you know, very simple problems or more complex problems, then that is also very, very interesting. A third one is their understanding of their first language by being immersed partly in the curriculum in a second language. But hey, why can't this happen from language learning? Well, I spent, I don't know, seven years learning French, and when I finished uh, high school, and maybe I was just a poor student, but when I finished high school, I couldn't, I couldn't use all of those words and rules of grammar in order to do things. I couldn't do that, okay? And I think this is a typical response of the experience of language learning, which certainly people of my generation have had, and it is the opposite to really what these youngsters are having when they learn a language, a foreign language, a second language, and they have a joy of learning, which comes about from a sense of freedom of achieving in that language from a very early stage. And the impact on metalinguistics, the impact on learning, and the impact on them as, as, as young people is very, very interesting indeed. So what have we said so far? We've said that we have the phenomenon of CLIL, which has been developing in different parts of the world in different ways. It was never uh, introduced as a new commercial uh, entity. It was never introduced as uh, owned by anybody or anything. It involved a whole load of different ways of looking at how can we do this better? And one of the most common uh, things that happens in a school is that the different clusters of teachers start to actually work together in order to uh, enhance the education of their different subjects. And this has been very, very strong uh, in general. And I think one of the most fascinating results from the neurosciences on why should we give one or two hours a week to immerse, in a way, uh, our students uh, in, in a class is the, the, the stimulation on the short-term memory, which is being recognized as starting from a very, very early stage. So the whole health and mind and brain work, and if you want to know more about this, it's Harvard University, Mind and Brain Society, I believe. If you Google that, you will find access to this kind of this kind of work. is very, very interesting indeed. What do we see? Um, let me tell you about Finland for a minute. Finland used to have quite a significant problem with um, outcome learning outcomes in English language. Okay? Um, there were always students who were good, and there were many very, very good Finnish speakers of English, um, but it wasn't widespread. But then things changed, and one of the ways that, one of the reasons why things changed with English was that students took ownership of the language because they had access to the internet. And that drove them, their self-confidence and their sense of ownership of the language, and Incredibly fast, we have got higher levels of the ability to use English than we ever had before. Now, some of the English language teaching evaluation experts may say, oh, no, no, no. The internet has been a problem because now these students think they can speak English, but in fact they can't. 
and these students are likened to you know it's like having a car with a big engine yeah they can go they can make a lot of noise but their steering uh, their steering uh, competences are very low the same thing happened with CLIL. When geography teachers and English teachers started working together and they started providing opportunities for children to learn about mountains or the rainforest in, in English, people said, but this is terrible. Uh, the children are speaking bad English to each other. Uh, the geography teacher's English is very, is, is, you know, she's got a very strong accent. And the results on, on these children's ability to do the exams will not be very good. And then there was various studies that showed that students who had two hours a week for 20 weeks learning geography and English were actually doing worse than students who only learned the English. Now, I want to come back to the story about Finland and the Internet. Because what the CLIL was doing, what the learning through geography was doing, it was actually empowering those students to take risks with the types the, and, and with the competence in the language that they had. And it was providing them with activities to teach each other the language. And it wasn't so whether their pronunciation was absolutely sharp or whether their ability to spell a word was correct. It was the power of achieving things using the language resources that they had, which was driving their hunger to learn English, which meant that they were becoming more receptive to, to the language and actually in many ways making them better English language students in the English language classroom and also in giving them a sense of ownership of that language. And it was developing what was situational adaptability. We were giving these young people even greater sense of self in handling complicated, the complicated lives in, in which we live. So where do I see this clear going? Well, I'm just one of many people who are involved with uh, language education. Um, if you sit around and have a cup of coffee and say, you know, is this a flash in the pan? Is it going to be, is CLIL going to be forgotten tomorrow? I think those people would say, yeah, the term may change. Yeah, but the concept, the concept of making language learning and actually geography learning or physics learning really highly relevant and active in the lives of these young people now is not going to go away because that is the life in which we live. The telephone of 10 years ago, the mobile was a telephone and now it's an integrated piece of high technology that does everything, wakes you up properly probably even sets your coffee machine on when you do as well. And that's how subjects in the curriculum appear to be moving in terms of those uh, educational systems which are doing really well in responding very, very fast to, to the interests and the needs of the young people. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to, I, I haven't been able to focus on this uh, chat box. It's like, you know, it's like an interesting sense of overload here. And I thank you very much for these. But what I'd like to do now is actually focus in on the chat box and see if I can respond to comments or questions that are beginning to, to come up at the same time. I see viewing sports and language learning on the same level. You know, I studied music when I was uh, 12 years old, and I remember a whole year of not actually getting my hands on a, on a, on a musical instrument. It was all theoretical, and I learned nothing. Um, I think CLIL is a little bit like learning to play the piano by having your hands on the keyboard as you start learning. So you don't need to necessarily understand so much, but once you have that excitement and interest in exploring yourself, and it becomes your responsibility. So it seems to be a, a confidence booster in learning the language. It just be the same as, as learning football. I have to do a clear task. Oh, my, my, my. Okay. Let me show you a really bad example of, of teaching. Um, can you take a piece of paper in your hand? Yeah. I can't actually do a, well, I can try and do a very bad. I do two tasks, okay? But for this, you need a, you need a piece of paper. Yeah? Piece of paper. Just take one piece of paper in your hand. 
Okay, this is very experimental. Probably high risk, but let's try. Okay, can you can you do what I do? Okay, just check the cameras right. Okay, this is a bad lesson. Okay, students, put the hand, put the paper in your hands. Yeah, fold the paper one way like that, and then fold it again like that. Come on, hurry up. Uh, you there, Benjamin in the background, wake up. Come on, stop talking. Okay, now. What you do is you rip off the top right hand corner of the piece of paper and you put that on the table so that the cleaners in the school don't get upset later. And you just turn it one more time. Come on, hurry up. And you rip off the bottom right hand corner. Okay? Just like that. All right. Excellent. I'm the teacher, so I'm always right. Here is the end result. So please open up your paper and tell me is that what you see? Is that the same? Is that the same as what you? Is the same as what you have in your hands, ladies and gentlemen? I'm looking at the chat box. No, Bianca says. No, no, no. Anastasia. No, Simona says no, 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 no. Anastasia, no. Michelle, I'm like, oh my goodness me. Oh, what a terrible teacher I am. Oh yes, well done, Nancy. Okay. <laughs> we have a profoundly bad failure rate because that was a miserable lesson. Take another piece of paper. People complain sometimes that um, in clear classes we don't have enough time to get through the curriculum. And what we say to that is, well, actually, that's possibly because the curriculum is too full. And so for this kind of, it is revolutionary, actually, for this kind of revolutionary educational practice to take root, the teacher must have a curriculum which is slight, which is not too heavy, and also must have an examination or an evaluation system which is to measuring competencies rather than just knowledge. Okay, and those two aspects are a real problem in some countries where teachers have become towered. They've been told to do more and more work and they've been told to pack the curriculum and they live in a world of exams which are actually not closely geared to, to modern life. And so one of the aspects of CLIL is that you'll see a slowdown in the amount of, of uh, input coming from the teacher, but you will see better results. Okay, now let's try this now. I'm going to turn around because I'm going to be language supportive, okay? Can you see me? Okay. All right, students, could you please turn the paper over towards you like this and then pat it down? Okay, and then I want you to fold it towards me. Fold it towards, sorry, towards yourself like that. And then do that, okay? And now, with your fingers, I want you please to rip off the top right hand side like that, okay? And then fold the paper towards you one more time like that. And then lift it this way, lift it up towards like, and rip off the top right hand corner. And now, and now, I hope we have the same results. <laughs> I'm a bit nervous about this because if you all say you got it wrong, it would have been a real disaster, but maybe that's to do with me or the camera. I hope the result you have is one like this. Is this the kind of result that you have? Yes, yes, awesome. Yes, 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 no. No? Yes. Turning a piece of paper like that is extremely demanding cognitively, particularly because of twisting the thing. Okay, it's a, it's a game. And therefore, I have to think, how can I now have these 40 or 100 people across the world try to manage this actually quite complicated task. And the reason to do it is simply to, to model it this way. Now, 
silly game as it is, when you look at a CLIL lesson, you are seeing similar techniques because the teacher really does understand the age-related abilities and the needs of his or her students in order to do the task. And if they are not doing as many tasks this year as they were doing five years ago, because we're, we're using these techniques, we need to look at how deep how deep the learning was, particularly in providing the competences that these young people need to learn how to learn. And I think this is, this is one aspect uh, which has been very, very classic in what you did. Thank you, Maria. It's an exciting community out there. Um, it's an exciting community out there. Um, one of the things that you, you might wish to consider doing is finding other language teachers in other countries who are um, in a similar situation to yourself. And I'm thinking here of those of you who are working uh, in very difficult schools, which certainly will be the case with, with some of us, um, under-resourced schools or, or schools in, in uh, remote, possibly in remote rural areas, and those of you who are working in the center of cities. The amount of satisfaction of having a very simple class uh, project done through another language, that is, so that the children in, um, where are you from, Anna? Anna's from. Okay, so that the children in Bulgaria are actually doing a very simple project with the children in Denmark using English uh, in a way where there is language support built in to the uh, tools that they're using, which would be a very, probably a very classic CLIL type project. Um, the impact of that on the lives of the youngsters, as well as on the sense of satisfaction and pleasure of the teachers, is, is quite profound. And one of the issues with English is a word, it relates to a word I did actually use earlier, which is fundamentally important and which you're mentioning here in the chat show about motivation. And that is confidence to do, you know, confidence to do. And um, there are two subjects in the curriculum which are particularly sensitive to, to negative emotion. Um, negative emotion which may come from listening to my parents say, we were good at languages or we would never look good at things and those two subjects are languages and mathematics and as language teachers if there's one thing that we can do now it is to look at the world professional community that are exploring CLIL to understand that it's a little bit like a, a, a fine perfume you don't necessarily need a lot of it in order for it to be effective to join that team and to share and learn by doing. And I think this is one of the major areas of, of satisfaction which is really generated a profound interest in CLIL and will be a reason why it will continue for a very long time. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry I, I couldn't um, introduce uh, David, um, but it doesn't need any words of introductions because, um, as I always say, is the uh, I mean um, the Godfather, the God of Clil is not only the star, but is the, the God of Clil. So we are really honoured to have you here, and uh, I want just to say that I just want to say that is um, it's quite rare to have David and. And uh, um, so this is for our uh, audience, for our colleagues. Um, uh, just want to underline that is a real um, uh, rare. So um, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for accepting our invitation, and um, it was really inspiring. So um, we are discussing in in the forum in. Um, our um, Moodle platform in, in Evo um, about all these issues you've been dealing with, and of course um, we wouldn't dare to we didn't dare to ask you uh, to uh, intervene to contribute in our forum because uh, it would be too demanding. And uh, as I said, it's uh, just a great honor for us to have you here. So we wouldn't dare to do that. But uh, what we can do, Daniela could maybe collect the questions that came out from this um, very interesting and inspiring session and maybe collect them in our 
our forum and as far as we can and with Gisela as well um, we can I mean answer as far as we can and if we have some particular uh, difficult or maybe some particular uh, topic and issues we, we can forward to David and uh, um, uh, let our colleagues in, in uh, the forum know the, the, the answers is that great? okay with you David um, if I, I, I'll join the forum we'll find a way Listen, everybody, I, I need to move on. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for your positive comments and feedback here. And I'll meet you in that uh, in that thank forum. You. Thank you. And goodbye. And goodbye, David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And just the last word, thank, I want to thank Nelly um, because for her hospitality, uh, really, really um, um, precious. So um, thank you. Uh, Daniela is here. I, I don't know if uh, we have time uh, to let us speak, just uh, to say hello. But uh, well, we will meet in in the forum. And um, uh, again, thank you all for for joining us. Goodbye.